Hi, I'm Siddharth Mishra. I'm Professor of Applied Mathematics at ETH Zurich. My research group is the Computational Applied Mathematics Laboratory, a part of the Seminar for Applied Mathematics here at the Department of Mathematics. I'm associated with the ETH AI Center as a co-faculty member. My research fields are numerical analysis, scientific computing, and machine learning. My main research interest is in the design of efficient algorithms for computer simulations in the sciences and engineering. So let me explain what it means. So the standard paradigm of science and engineering today is the following. If you have a physical phenomena, biological phenomena, something in chemistry, what you do first is you try to model it, express it in mathematical terms. Often these models take the form of mathematical objects called partial differential equations. Now the thing is to solve these uh, partial differential equations. Unfortunately, we cannot do that on pen and paper. We cannot have solution formulas. What we need to do is to design algorithms that can simulate them on a computer and let the computer do the work for us. And people have been doing this since the 1920s. So there has been a hundred year history of this and a lot of different numerical methods or algorithms have been developed to do this. For instance, the finite difference methods, finite element methods, finite volume methods, spectral methods and so on. And in my research group, we do a lot of work on these methods, refining them, analyzing them, implementing them on the largest possible supercomputers that we can lay our hands on. And this has been very, very successful in different areas. For instance, in astrophysics, we were able to simulate the core collapse of supernovas. In the geophysical sciences, we have been able to simulate uh, rocks like generated tsunamis, avalanches, which is very relevant here in Switzerland. In climate science, we have been able to simulate stratocumulus clouds that are very, very important for climate change and global warming feedbacks. In engineering, the design of aircraft, of rockets, and in biology, for instance, morphogenesis, the modeling of how cells differentiate into different parts of the tissue. All this has been done by using efficient computer algorithms for solving partial differential equations. Let me give you a concrete example to illustrate what we do. So imagine that we are modeling or we are trying to understand or predicting tsunamis. You know, tsunamis are very powerful events with uh, tragic consequences often, but that's why they need to be understood, they need to be modeled, they need to be predicted in advance so that people can be evacuated in time. Now let's try to take a concrete example of the Mediterranean. Thankfully, tsunamis are not that often uh, common in the Mediterranean, but let's see. So how, do you, how does a tsunami happen? So what happens is that there is an earthquake under the ocean, and because there is an earthquake, uh, the earth is raised up under the ocean. That leads to a little rise in the sea level. And once the sea level rises a little in the middle of the ocean, it generates a tsunami. The wave travels all over the Mediterranean. And what you're interested in is what is going to be the magnitude, the amplitude of the wave when it hits the coast. When exactly is it going to hit the coast? What is the arrival time? What will be the surge at the coast? All these issues are taken into account in designing a tsunami early warning system. How is it done? So the earthquake, uh, the tsunami itself is modeled by partial differential equations called the shallow water equations, nonlinear partial differential equations. The earthquake happens and the parametrization of how this earthquake impacts the sea level rise is modeled by a parametric model, something called the Okada model. So today, instead of the art tsunami early warning systems, what happens is that as soon as the earthquake happens, the parametrization, the Okada parameters are calculated. There is a lot of uncertainty in that because they have to be measured. Nevertheless, once these parameters are there, then a shallow water equations are solved on the computer on the state of the art GPUs and tsunami warnings are issued. This is very successful. However, there is a little caveat. And the caveat is that this entire process on the state of the art systems takes approximately one hour. Now, one hour might seem a uh, little time. However, a tsunami can hit the coast in 10 minutes. So one hour can be useless. So what we need to do is to reduce the computational cost. And this is an issue which mars numerical algorithms, computer simulations in the sciences and engineering as we speak. The reason is that uh, computer simulations, even on the state-of-the-art supercomputers, are very, very expensive. Let me give you a further example from my own work. So we try to simulate the flow of a fluid, of a gas, in three dimensions, uh, a compressible flow. And this is done on the largest supercomputer that we have access to, which is based in, in Lugano at the Swiss Supercomputing Center. And a single simulation, we have an optimized code for this, a single simulation 
takes approximately 300 node hours uh, in on this supercomputer. But however, a single simulation is not very useful because these are chaotic turbulent systems. So we need to simulate them many, many times, hundreds and hundreds of maybe thousands of times. And if I take 1000 simulations to form an ensemble, then the cost if you convert it into Swiss francs is approximately 1 million Swiss francs for a single ensemble simulation. So it is too expensive. Now imagine all the different scientific problems that we need to solve. We have to uh, predict the climate, we have to predict the weather, we have to design interesting systems, we have to understand physical phenomena in astrophysics and so on. And in all over the world, supercomputing centers, they solve these kind of problems on a daily basis at a very, very high cost. So we need to reduce the cost of numerical simulations to make them accessible and to enable us to do scientific discoveries, to discover interesting scientific phenomena. The second issue which marks current numerical simulations is the role of data. Now as all of you know, we have better and better at getting data, lots and lots of data with cheap devices, sensors and so on. The current paradigm of numerical simulations does not take into account how this data can be integrated, can be incorporated into the numerical simulations. So we need to change that. How can we reduce the cost? How can we add data into the simulations? This is exactly where artificial intelligence in the form of machine learning makes a big appearance. So as many of you might know, modern machine learning learns for, takes data, lots and lots of data and converts it into predictions, converts it into inferences about the system that we are interested in observing. Now what we are going to do is that we are going to deploy state of the art machine learning systems, particularly deep neural networks and use them in the context of scientific problems. So instead of solving a partial differential equation on a computer, we are going to combine computer simulations and we are going to combine real world data and train neural network in order to predict uh, different responses to different inputs. Now the promise here is that a neural network is a much faster evaluation, is much faster to compute than our traditional numerical algorithms for solving PDEs for physical systems. Now this is very promising. However, there are many, many different challenges. For instance, one of the challenges is that the amount of data that is necessary is limited in the context of physical systems. Now just imagine, if you want to use data for facial recognition, it's very cheap to take images, lots and lots of images of lots and lots of people. Now if you want to do the same with the weather, we have only one weather system. So you have data, but less data than what you do in sort of a computer science context. So what are we going to do there? So we have to learn with limited amounts of data. On the other hand, we have some knowledge of the physics of the system. We can leverage that knowledge of the physics of the system, for instance, partial differential equations, other physical laws, conservation laws, symmetries and so on. And what we are going to do is that we are going to combine them, leverage them, combine them with data, with computer simulations and create a prediction engine by which responses to different inputs can be inferred. And they can be inferred fast and they can be inferred accurately. For instance, the same example that I gave you with respect to tsunamis, remember that it took approximately an hour to do a computer simulation, to do a early warning system based on traditional numerical methods. Now we have used a lot of data based on computer simulations and then we have trained a machine learning system, state of the art machine learning system to do a prediction and this prediction happens in less than a second. So now we have been able to do this uh, several orders, four orders of magnitude faster than what was achievable before. So there is a lot of promise for these kind of artificial intelligence systems. However, care has to be exercised. These systems have to be robust, they have to be accurate and they have to be efficient. This necessarily entails a thorough mathematical investigation of different aspects of machine learning and which is also done in my group to a, to a great extent. So, so far what I have said is we try to innovate and deploy state of the art machine learning systems to learn physics essentially. But it's also interesting to look the other way and ask the other question, the converse question. And what would that be? Can we use physical principles, biological principles uh, to design machine learning systems? And this is also a part of the research that is done in my group. We appeal to physical principles, uh, physical systems in order to abstractize and in order to design state of the art machine learning systems. For instance, we consider damped oscillators because our neurons are damped oscillators. 
we consider Hamiltonian systems, we consider the graph neural networks which are designed as oscillators. So we learn from the physical principles, for instance, multi-scale systems and so on. And we design state-of-the-art machine learning systems uh, which have nice properties. For instance, they can have long memory like oscillators have long memory. They have high expressivity. And we see the fruits of our action in, in state-of-the-art experiments. For instance, these days everyone has, uh, everyone wears different kinds of sensors. Uh, during the times of COVID, we are all using pulse oximeters to calculate our oxygen, blood oxygen levels, our heart rate and so on, pulse rate and so on. And it turns out that the way these small devices work is that they use ECG signals, they use PPG signals and they convert it into a heart rate, into a respiration rate, other bio-observables. How is this done? This is done by machine learning systems. So we develop machine learning systems based on oscillators, based on multi-scale systems that provide the state of the art results and even orders of magnitude, an order of magnitude speed up or an order of magnitude less error than what state of the art machine learning systems are providing before. So there is a two way dialogue between machine learning and physics. You can use machine learning to improve our understanding of physics, to make better predictions, to make better simulations. On the other hand, you can also appeal to physical principles, abstract forms of physical principles in order to design better machine learning systems. And this is this confluence, this constant churning between machine learning and physics that is sort of the ebb and flow that sort of defines what happens in my research group to a good extent when it comes to artificial intelligence. So it is instructive to say how the ETH AI Center helps me and other researchers in our work. So the ETH AI Center, what we do is that we pool, we combine expertises in different areas of science and engineering and we put them together under one roof, under one umbrella and we try to see if these synergies are going to lead to massive changes, massive improvements in the sort of systems, in the predictions that we have. It turns out that this is a beautiful an inspirational multidisciplinary environment. Within the AI, uh, AI center, I get to talk to professional computer scientists whose expertise is in machine learning. I get to talk to different domain scientists, people who are doing computer vision, people who are doing natural language processing, people who are trying to understand the climate, who are trying to do interesting robotic work. And then we talk to each other, we try to collaborate on seeing how our ideas can fertilize each other's works. And this is a truly inspirational environment and I'm really grateful to the opportunities that the AI Center provides us and younger people, PhD students and postdocs to pursue this kind of collaborative research. Now if you're looking out 10 to 15 years from now, let's look into the field of scientific computing. So already there have been tremendous successes and we anticipate that with the use of machine learning, with the use of other artificial intelligence systems, we are going to have a tremendous acceleration in the speed of discovery and in the speed of design. Because today to discover a new physical phenomena, a new physical law, or to design a new product, a new material or a new vehicle, it takes a lot of time. One of the bottlenecks in the design cycle is the speed of computing. And what will happen once these AI systems are deployed, once they are realized in realistic settings, is that we'll bring down the cost tremendously. And this will enable us probably to find new physical laws. This will enable us to design new, hitherto unknown designs. And this is going to be a big enabler for scientific discovery as well as for engineering. So this will be the first tangible step that I think that is going to happen in the next 10 to 15 years. One of the key issues that uh, confounds us in terms of scientific computing is the cost and access. Today, state-of-the-art, cutting-edge scientific computing is done in the largest supercomputing centers in the world and it uh, costs enormous amount of money and enormous amounts of energy. Now, once these AI systems are deployed, we believe that there will be a democratization of access for scientific computing. Hopefully one day, 10 to 15 years from now, we can predict the weather on our mobile phone. We can do a climate simulation on our mobile phone. We'll be able to scale these algorithms to such an extent, possibly use cloud solutions such that these, there will be much more access for ordinary researchers to be able to evaluate their models, to be able to discover new physical laws, and to be able to discover and design new products. So that will be the sort of long-term vision that we are going to think about. Cheap computing, accurate computing, accessible computing. And that is my main vision.